Uh, welcome to the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge. I'm your host of the Football Network World's Weekly Discussion with football coaches from around the world. Today I'm joined by two top practitioners from the foundation level. We've got uh, Lawrence Hallett, who's the uh, lead foundation coach at Cardiff City. And Jupe Oosterveld is the uh, technical head of foundation at PSV Eindhoven. Well, I'll uh, fully introduce you to the guys in just a moment. Um, first of all, I'm just going to uh, share my screen with you all uh, so you can get a, a bit of an overview of, of what we're going to talk about today. There we go. So, yes, today's development focus and approaches at the foundation phase. As always, we'll try and uh, split the, uh, the discussion into, into two halves. So in a moment, I'll introduce you to the guys and then Lawrence and, and Jupe will uh, give brief presentations on, on the work they're doing, at the foundation phase at their clubs. And when we get into the discussion, so that you can try and focus your questions to the guys on these topics and we can filter them into the discussion. Um, so we can uh, get on to that discussion. Let me start introducing you to uh, today's guest. So I will start with uh, Jupe. Oosterveld at PSV. Jupe, how are you today? I'm really fine, thank you. Yep. Looking forward to the session. Great to be here. Yeah, it's uh, great to have you with us. Um, I just wondered, yeah, for everyone out there, just to introduce yourself, tell them a little bit more of your background, your pathway that's led you to PSV, and then a little bit about the role you currently have. Yeah, thank you. I'm uh, just, uh, I started my career when I was 15 years old, so I started with a grassroots level. And I think after, after a wide part, so when I've been to PSV at the moment now, so I start with the grassroots level. Then um, the Dutch FA appointed me as a um, instructor and they appointed me as, um, as a coach. So then I went to, uh, to Venlo at VVV. That's the club they played last year in the Premier League, but they're relegated, so they play championship at the moment now. And I started as an assistant coach in 90 because I did my last uh, UFA course. So it was a sort of a combination. And then I became on a 17s head coach as a sort of uh, assistant coach of the, uh, of the youth academy. Uh, so I was uh, a lead coach, also the head coach of the development phase and I was head of the recruitment. So really a big uh, uh, job application for me at that moment. And then um, I think four years ago, uh, PSV appointed me as, uh, as the lead coach of the honor 12 and sort of ahead of the uh, foundation phase. And it's not really similar at, uh, just at the level and uh, age groups in England because we start on a race and the foundation phase is uh, still under 14. So under 13 is my last team where I'm responsible of instead of uh, um, the philosophy and the way they work. So that's in uh, just one minute of my background. So uh, start with the grassroots and the end uh, at the biggest uh, academy in a lot now. All right, fantastic. And um, so bringing Lawrence Hallett. Lawrence, how, how are things down in Cardiff today? Oh, good. We, 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 I've j less than 10 minutes ago, just got back. We've uh, just played against Leicester. Our fixtures today at Leicester City's new training ground, which is state of the art, I've got to say, a really fantastic facility. Yeah. So, how, how did you get on? Um, across the age groups did quite well. The age group I had didn't do so well today. It wasn't <laughs> it was the best way of putting it. We had one of those days today. Um, but uh, generally, we did quite well. We, we're, um, we, we're Cardiff City, I guess, because so we're a championship team, but we, we do tend to do quite well if we measure it on games won and lost type thing around that. But I guess you're after my background, so I'll fill in with my background. Yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit more, uh, yeah, as, I, as I'm already aware of, but if you share it with everyone else who's out there, quite a, 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 a different route into, into yeah, Cardiff a, a City route. Academy my, than most coaches. My, my childhood was spent... Um, really a football mad, football mad, playing football all the time. And in my late teens or my early teens, I got into cycling and I became a racing cyclist. And um, I wasn't as good at that as I thought I should be. And I, I was just driven that way. So I got into running and I, I took up running and I did quite well at running. And um, I still run today. I still run once a day, every day. Um, I probably I do 40 to 50 miles a week, every, every, every week. Uh, and it's sort of a lifelong thing. But my, as my children, as family and everything, my children start playing football. I was going along to grassroots football and I was thinking, oh my God, what is happening here? 
I was looking at what was happening there compared to what I was used to. You know, I'd meet with my coach at the beginning of the season, say, what are our goals this season? Here's the training schedule. Um, so this is how we'll load it and this is what we'll do. And I was looking at football and the old phrase jumpers for goalposts seemed to fit. And I was just observing and the coach said, well, you seem to have done a bit of this. Do you fancy go at this? I said, okay. And um, the, I started running a grassroots team. I then bought a football franchise called Brazilian Soccer Schools, which is all about football to Salau Futsal, as it's now more commonly known. And um, with a couple of colleagues, started doing that. Cardiff City saw what we were doing, came along, asked me if I'd be interested in coaching for them. And so I started, I started with the prep and then took some of the foundation phase age groups. I went up to the under 15s and then following a trip to Barcelona to watch, see, watch La Masia, watch the academy teams up there. I was completely taken with the, the foundation phase kids. We went out and watched their 15s and I was just taken by the way they played, how much it looked like football. And um, the job came up, I thought, go for it. And that's how I ended up where, where I am. So it was... My, my sort of day job for all that period has been a business consultant. So I look at organizations, see how they're structured, how they're striving to choose. So, sorry, it's a bit long-winded that, but that's sort of the convoluted response to it. No, 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 it's perfect, perfect. We'll uh, dig a little bit deeper into that then in a moment. But I think we'll, we'll start with our first presentation of the day with uh, allow uh, Dupe to go, to go first. Um, so Dupe, let's uh, get your... Hopefully, I want your presentation there up on screen. So uh, it's the foundation face at PSV. So yeah, Jube, I'll uh, hand over to you to, to explain a little bit more then of how you work things at that U8 to under 13s. Yeah, one of my uh, things I want to improve as a as speaker is to uh, to uh, to keep it simple because normally I give a presentation in 90 minutes and I have uh, around the 40 sheets. So I challenge myself today to put it to one sheet. Um, but we are quite unique in the foundation phase because um, I think or six or seven years ago, there's just one foundation phase at PSV. So um, we recruit players in the half of Holland. So in that case, um, some kids have to travel 90 minutes to train in Eindhoven at PSV and have to try to travel nine, 90 minutes back to where they live. So that's the reason why we have different development centers, than development centers in um, in a lot now so we have we had five we have four now so instead of travel 90 minutes now they have to travel half an hour or 20 minutes because they uh, train at the, the, the nearest development centers or where they live that's quite unique so that's the reason why normally if you have an under 10 team you have around 20 players and we have more than 40 players in for example uh, our under 10 so we have more development centers we have more coaches and we have smaller groups so we can uh, give players more attention than you have as in, in, in a normal uh, academy so that's we think is quite unique um, so what we also do is we have uh, we intend we have an intention for players that we recruit uh, at eight or nine years old we it's not not a promise but normally when you develop well you can stay with us for three or four years because when they go to the high school on a 13 that's the first year we make a decision if they stay at PSV or they have to drop out to other teams. So if you play on a 13, you go to the high school, which is in Eindhoven, and that's the first year that they train every day in Eindhoven instead of training on your own development center. So that, that pathway of three or four years, you can stay with us and we help you to develop your own uh, pathway of, in your own uh, um, uh, individual development plan. So that's the reason why we think it's quite unique. Um, so we can um, develop more, more, more players, but also more coaches because every development center has around uh, eight coaches, three lead coaches, because we have under 10, under 11, under 12 on each development center. Uh, so you need coaches, you need assistant coaches, you need specialists over there. So we call them stars because we would like to uh, create stars together um, at PSV. So we have some things that we think is quite important for the players. And in English, you call it super strength, but we call it outstanding ability. Uh, what's the reason you play at PSV in the foundation phase? So what's the reason we select you for the under 13s? Or what's the reason why you can uh, go to the first team of PSV? Um, so we focus on things what players are really good at, just in recruitment, but also 
if they are with us in the foundation phase. Um, what they all have in common is they are really fast and they, um, they have the right agility and they have a lot of ex- uh, electric skills because if you look to modern football, you need them to play on championship level. Um, you need a dedication, not only as a football player, but also as for your parents because we train 10 hours a week and we play a match on Saturday or on Sunday. Um, so for all the parents and also for the players, yeah, it's really, uh, really changed for them um, with, with the grassroots level where they play uh, before they join PSV. Because of, we have a lot of different development centers, you have to be, they have to be ad- adaptable because you need ad- adaptability because we play our matches with all the, all the development centers together. Um, we train with different groups at the development centers. So, for example, if you're on a FEM player, you have just your own mentor who's your coach at your uh, development center, but you see him just once, once a week. So you see your mentor once a week because in other uh, days and training sessions, you play with different coaches, you play with different kids, but sometimes we, on a FEM player, train with two or one years older. And sometimes we let play an under 11 kid with just a year below. Uh, we we would like to challenge them with different coaches, with different age groups, but also on Saturday with different development centers. And on, on, on Saturday, we play against different levels. So sometimes we play to Ajax and sometimes we play to a championship team. And we also make a combination of the, of the development centers. But sometimes we do it on, um, on, on level or on resistance, or sometimes we do it on um, biological age, or sometimes we do it on maturity. So we have different uh, elements where we select players on to play matches or to play tournaments. So that's the reason why we think as our coaches, because a normal coach has his own team with 16 players. You train them every day and you prepare your team for a match, but we don't. We prepare the individuals to be a better football player. So that's the reason why we think you need to be adaptable to have a good career in football because the situation change every day, every week, every year. Um, so they need to be adaptable for different players, different coaches, different environments, uh, different uh, 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 countries when we go abroad to play tournaments. So that's the reason why we think uh, um, they have to be adaptable, but also need a sort of an ownership because it's not our careers, it's their careers. So uh, we're the first team in Holland. We, we have an IDP. Uh, you're used to it in England because every Academy has their own IDP system for the, for, for the kids, but in Holland, it's just quite new. Um, so that's the reason why they need ownership, because it's their, uh, uh, their career, not ours. So that's the reason why they can uh, ask for different mentors to help them to, um, to improve their outstanding abilities or new focus points. So that's the reason why we customize their own plan and we, we, we give specialists, but also give responsibility for the players. Choose your own mentor who can help you with some things you want to improve. So that's the reason why we have a, a unique learning environment. And of course, we want to have players on championship level, but it's really hard to predict who is making the first team at that age. So we have a different uh, style of, of kids, so not only the, 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 the big players, the early mature players, but also small kids. Um, so we, we recruit on performance, on potential. We have different outstanding abilities because uh, four years ago, there were a lot of dribblers, and now we have a good mixture of dribblers, passers, good defenders, really good strikers. Again, they all have in common they have a sort of dedication and they are really skillful, uh, athletic skills, and they, have, uh, they are really fast on the first 10 meters. So that's our Champions League level we ask the players, but their uh, uh, unique identity is, in our opinion, the most important thing in the foundation phase. Um, and not only with players, but also I uh, uh, recruit and develop a lot of coaches. So not only players go to under 13 uh, and higher, but also a lot of coaches, they make promotion uh, in, uh, in hours. So you start with zero hours, then you have a contract of 20 hours part-time. They become a full-time coach in the foundation phase. So that's the promotion in the foundation phase. And of course, they can promote to development phase or professional phase. So that's the reason why I think we're quite, uh, we're quite unique in our system. So there's a little, little, uh, little impression how we, uh, we work in the foundation suite of PSV. Okay, Jupiter, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, certainly 
learn a lot more about that. That's kind of yeah, interesting that the pathway is not only for players but also also there to develop the coaches as well, which I think is uh, yeah very important. Um, but before we get into that, um, I'll hand the screen over to Lawrence. I should have spoke to you beforehand, you, so I could have cut my slides down to just the one as well. I got loads, by the way, I got loads of questions for you after listening to yours. There's loads of things of interest for me. Um, in, in terms of Cardiff City and the foundation phase, I would say our catchment area probably encompasses an area that's probably about 60 miles long, but maybe 30 miles wide. It goes along what's called the M4 corridor probably a population in the region of 1 million, maybe just a bit more. So uh, for us, you know, like if I use PSV as an example, there's an attraction to the name. Cardiff City is world famous in our area, <laughs> if you like, not necessarily world famous, although known. So for us, recruitment is a vital part. And I'll, I'll try and allude to all this as it goes through. The first thing about Cardiff City, they're a championship team last year. We just missed out in the playoffs uh, and getting into the Premier League. Uh, yesterday, we, we had the first game of the new championship season. We had two academy recruits start. A third one came on, and we had two others on the bench. So we five of the squad yesterday were from our academy. Two joined at 16. One was released by another club. The other we found in non-league football. The other three were with us from the age of eight. So there's a pathway there, but it, we've had fallow years prior to that. Um, and so... What we have is a team that is a first team. And this will fit into the rest as it comes along, by the way. For us, it's trying to make our way into that top tier. That, that's a challenge now. To enable us to do that, our managers will take the route that best befits that. So it doesn't mean, as you know, like if you're in Barcelona or something and they'd say, we're going to play 4 3 3, we're going to do it this way, this way, this way. We don't have that. We've had Neil Warnock, who got us into the Premier League, plays very direct football. But it worked. So, so what we had to do, we had to say, well, we can't align with the first team. It's not necessarily about aligning with the first team. It was about saying, what's the de best development pathway? And so that's the way we had to approach it. Um, the way it works for us, I've, I've tried to summarize it. So, so as you were saying there, they, was it U8 to U13? We're pre-academy for us, which is prior to signing. We start signings at U9. Our pre-academy starts at six. And so the foundation phase would go pre-academy through to U12, but all those under eight and below can't sign for the club. We're hoping they will. But in terms of how we approach that, the emphasis of pre-academy is on recruitment, gain intensity, by that we mean mental engagement. So this thing about being a self-learner, the premise behind our system is that if we can engage a hunger to be better at the game, we are instilling a lifelong learning approach, not just a football to anything. So we see pre-academy as a selection process, not coaching process. And what we do is put on events that enable the kids to express their talent. So it's, there is some coaching, but it, it's not extensive. When they go to nine and 10, we're now looking to enhance an engagement. We call intensity is the thing people think of physical intensity, but for us, it's about engagement. We do some stuff on shape, but it's really about the individual sort of growing and becoming clear on how, how they fit into a team without much reference to it. When we get to 11 and 12, we then start nine aside at this age. And so we see that there's like all the technical stuff and individual stuff is going on as a baseline. We then introduce um, more about game understanding, understanding people's roles, how you fit into a team. So I guess from what you'd said, we're probably doing that a couple of years earlier than you guys started. But that's, so for us, we, that, I, I like the idea of what you were saying about, you know, we have these, um, the centers and you have 20 kids, wherever many it is at each one, and you, you select a team. So we have basically have, we have to sign according to Academy rules. We have to sign so many players, all players have to get 50% playing time, et cetera. So we're bound by a squad. Um, so that's a, a first separation I see between us, but that's just the areas of emphasis. One of the things that um, I guess that we try when we approach this, when I took over this role, we were very much about it was technical, technical, technical at the younger ages, which which I understand. Um, 
but try to look at it slightly different how they characterize and they characterize the football player as intensity so engaged awareness what do you see execution which includes the physical characteristics which are obviously escalating as time's going on and the ability to um, execute what you see in the sense of you have the technical capability to do it and decision making and when we concentrate on the intensity in the early stages, the, all this is a bit of a messy slide, but it's basically saying small pitch games, et cetera. These in, down the middle are things that we do to enable those things. These are the things that we thought inhibited it. So it's sort of showing things we tend to do more of it down the center, less of down the right hand side, but we do both because if someone has a remedial skill, we'll do lots of an opposed low rep, uh, high repetition work with them. So, but we, it was the ones that were interesting. Um, I, I've said to a number of people before, I went to Disney a few years ago. I was trained by Disney in creativity and innovation. And they, they presented creativity is the capacity to generate ideas. Innovation is the ability to implement them. Well, when I related that to football, I saw awareness as the creative ability. What do you see? How, how much do you see? And the decision making, the execution is the ability to do it. The decision making is making the choice. If I only see one thing, I can only execute one thing. There's no decision to be made. So it was trying to announce that. And so pitch sizes became a factor to us, but I'm sure we'll talk more about that. By the way, this 80-20 here is, we try to make our sessions 80% ball rolling time at the foundation phase. Don't always do it, but so it's only 20% of talk, talk or drinking. Um, our games model, we, every year we're allocated 19 games by the Premier League. On to, across 39 weekends. So we have to go chasing games. Um, we, we have to, you know, so, so we've done all sorts of things. But the one thing we did, uh, we, we were chatting before this event, was talk about, start. so we started the game. So a games, a games program, one of those 19 games we're given, if you win or lose, there's no consequence, but it enables us to embed playing principles, individual development needs. It's just a weekly game without a consequence. And so that has a place. When we go to tournaments, a local one, say, we would look to enhance that learning capability, but add a bit of competitive side to it. So the second strata is competitive because it becomes irrelevant. When we go to an international tournament, for us, it's about competitive benchmarking. So, you know, what are we playing against? Have we, are there kids that are doing something significantly different to us? Far greater capabilities. Uh, so for us, it's a chance to see what else is out there on a broad, broader scale. So that, that's a really important part for us. So, so that's how we start the games. Some people will call that comfort, learning, stress is another way of characterizing. That's just how we do it. Um, I thought I'd put this up. This is just a summary of the, the journey we've been on, some of the lessons we learned. You see at the end there on the right-hand side, got the COVID uh, thing. That's made a big effect on us. So it's really detracting. But... but the program we went through in 2016, we had to be clear on what we were trying to do. And the other thing, we had to get people to buy into it. So we wanted to make a change. For us, our methodology became what we, we thought, what's the best way to develop the children? Well, let's expose them to the maximum number of experiences. And so the first thing we thought as a club, we'd like to dominate the ball as an academy. It's not a prerequisite, but it was the thing. And we set some things around it. So we put a methodology and a structure behind it. Pitch sizes, the way we, why pitch sizes on there, um, it was really an observation of mine, I guess, that if you want to learn to juggle six balls, you don't start with six balls, you start with one. So the first thing I noticed that lots of people play on very, very small pitches. So all that did was get your head down. There was no chance to have that awareness to see things. So it was just done. To, it doesn't matter so much to us these days because we've progressed it a bit, but that was the start point. You see the games program, how we escalated it. First, the games program is, Variety, volume, um, variety, uh, competition. We see competition very important in it. So they're, they're significant parts for us. They're, they're not the only things, but they're, they're the things. So you can see as our games program. Oh, quality was the other one, of course, yeah. Playing against the best quality opposition we could. We always saw that was important in the, in the process. So I'll, I'll spare you all those. It's just, I hope that gives you a little insight to what we're about without giving too much and, uh, and also of course, there have been lots of pitfalls along the way, as we've learned, but hopefully that's an insight. I'll stop the share, shall I, Steve? Yes, yes. I've got control of that. Thanks for that, Lawrence. Yeah, that was uh, yeah, that was fantastic. A nice, like I say, a nice teaser 
for for us all to now uh, to get our teeth into. Um, before we do that, I'll just sort of yeah, to remind everyone there's a, a little Q and A tab down at the bottom of your screen. So if you have questions for Jupe and Lawrence on, on the work that they're doing at, at the foundation phase, please uh, use that to fire your questions to them and we'll get through as many of those, but be quick because I'm sure Jupe has lot, lots of questions for Lawrence and as Lawrence has already mentioned, he has plenty of questions for Jupe. So Lawrence, I'll let you jump in first, but I wondered if, yeah, if you have a particular question that was more based around possibly the how how their foundation level is is structured in terms of the number of teams, players, coaches, and how they're yeah yeah it, it just really is, the bit about it that interests me is that you have four centres I think you said in in across the whole of the Netherlands is that yeah so let's say you have I'm guessing you've got ten to fifteen in each one at each age group would that be about right a mm, little, little bit less I think we have forty two players at under ten. 34 under 11 and 43 in under 12 at this moment. So if you're going for a, an international tournament, um, who do you pick? Yeah, we intend to give every player a one international tournament a year. Um, so one time abroad on one good tournament in Holland. Um, but when you be, be getting older, um, sometimes we have one tournament um, we're going to win a tournament, so sometimes we uh, the, we pick the players where we can think they earn it to be at that tournament. So then we pick the players where we can win the tournament with. Um, so everybody plays one or two tournaments abroad, uh, one or two international tournaments. But we change we change this, the, the 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 squads every week, um, but also every tournament. So they're not not really used of uh, of the same. Team, when they're going to play tournaments with. How, how do you um, make comparisons? So, you know, you've got coaches in one area and coach in another. How, how are you able to say, yeah, because I, I know what it would be like. I've got these three players in my squad in this part of the Netherlands and they're doing fantastic. They, they've got to be the best. How do you enable that comparison? Yeah, what I do, um, um, I focus on the first part of the under 12s because it's really important here because it's, we make a decision to on the 13s. So on Tuesday and Wednesday, all the under 12 players come to Eindhoven to train. Um, so in the first half year, I'm trained with all the under 12 kids, with all the coaches. So that's the reason why I can develop the players and the coaches, but also make a clear um, um, clear view on the level. Um, but on Monday and on Thursday, I go uh, around all the development centers to work with the players or with the coaches. So... I see I see all the players um, one or two or three times a month. So that's the reason um, why I have uh, uh, the biggest opinion in the development of the players. And we have a lot of meetings with our staff every week. And then we once a month, we're going to talk with all the coaches, uh, with all the players, how uh, is the development of every player. Do you have something that other coaches need to know before you can develop them? So... Of course, the, the, the biggest um, opinion about the players are the coaches by themselves. But if, if someone has to make a mistake because we have too many players for just tournament, then I'll make a decision. He's going to that tournament and he's going to the other tournament. So instead of level and under 12, it's, um, yeah, it's really difficult to make decisions. And with under 10 and with under 11, yeah, they, they, they make different teams with different tournaments but not making decisions on level or performance to players. So that's, that's easier than with under 12, for example. And when I said to you, I spoke with the Benfica lads and they were saying that they have centres all over Portugal and they bring them together, I think, at under 13 as well. And they end up with a squad of 32 players or something of that order. Is that how it works with you? So it, and that's the bit you were saying about going to the same school and all the rest, is it? Yeah, it, 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 and our philosophy depends on how many tenants we have on championship level uh, or with performance or with potential who can go to the first team. It's really hard to make the decisions by the players on the 13. So last year we had 21 players. The year before we had 24 players and maybe next year we have 30 players. It depends on the amount of talent in the, in, in the teams. Um, so this year we have a, a squad team on Saturday, we have under 31, we have under 32. So all the kids can play matches on Saturday. 
Um, so we don't have to uh, select amount of, uh, of uh, players. It depends on the tenants and the outstanding ability. So uh, and then they continue to on a 14, on a 15, and on a development center, it's, it's a little bit the same. And then when they go to on a 16, on a 17, now we have a really uh, a good, good picture on which players are really talented to the first team. And then the uh, recruitment of other big clubs in Holland, they bring the best players of other big clubs in that teams around on the 15, on the 16. And four or five years ago, we just had 13 or 14 players in on the 13. So there were a lot of new players from other big clubs and 14 or 15 or 16 years old. So now we have to only recruit the best player to add to the additional squads that we have instead of uh, bring six or seven players uh, from other big clubs and on at each age group. So that's the reason why it's also not only unique in the philosophy, but also good for uh, recruitment, the good for our philosophy to develop our own players from our younger ages. Well, the other thing, uh, it's slightly off the issue of structure, but it intrigued me. You highlighted speed and you said not to 10 meters was, was the criteria, that you, so you, you stars. So you sort of said you also bring in not just big and all the other things. Is that a prerequisite? Because like I said to you, I, I, lots of the Dutch teams that I've encountered in tournaments and everything, they tend to be not just good, ath pure athletic speed, but aerobically quite good as well. You know, they sort of go, go, go. Is, so is it, where does that fit in your selection process? Uh, we, we test all our um, triadist players in under eight or nine. So we have the same, you have sort of a pre-academy uh, pre under eight or nine. Um, players from that age can only play at PSV if we think it's the right moment. So if it isn't the right moment, they play with grassroots at under eight or under nine. But we test all those players. We test it on bad ends, we test it on jump tests, we test it on agility, we test them on speed in zero to 30 meters. Um, so we have a really clear um, analyzed system with six or seven tested testers. Um, the other thing is we look to behavior, we look to adaptability because always if you recruit, you recruit the best player of the team. And if you put the 12 best players together, you have a worst player, you have a best player, you have a second best player. So the whole behavior changes in every situation. So that's the reason why we have a really clear system with testing all the players on, on, on uh, agility or athletic skills, but also in behavior. And now we can make a clear decision before we go um, to work with the guys for three or four years before we make a selection to go to an attorney. I have a colleague who suggested I get in touch with you guys, purely coincidentally, though you're only here today. And he said, you need to talk to PSV about the way they analyze behaviors. So is that a unique thing to PSV? Mm, I, I don't think it's unique, but we have so many players that we, we, um, we have so many different players that you need to be uh, adaptable because of the different centers and the different players and the different coaches. So um, if you have 20 coaches instead of two or three coaches, it change you as a person, change you as a, as a kid. So I think that's the reason why they are um, maybe two or three years older than they are instead of behavior because they are used of the system. Okay. Yeah, so that was kind of like one of the big interesting differences there in the structure that in terms of the contact time with, with different coaches, um, I just wondered if in an average week, you know, a player from one centre, how many different coaches could he be, be seeing? So I imagine Lawrence, you've probably got your head coach and an assistant coach and they're the two coaches for the for the whole season, pretty much. Uh, we, it's pretty much that. The way it works is we span two age groups. So we would have four coaches operating across two, two areas. So for example, the age group I'm working with at the moment, uh, there are four of us and we'll spend eight weeks with each group. So, the, so what we have to do is get clear the areas of emphasis, um, but the different faces, certainly not as uh, rigorous as what Jupiter's described with PSV. So our, ours is a, a, dilute, a very diluted version of that. But with you, Jupe, I mean, is it a weekly thing where you will see a, a, an individual player, say an under nines player, for example, would see multiple coaches or is it do you work it out in blocks so that they will be with these coaches for x amount of weeks and then you'll swap it over 
depending on what the, the, the training block focus is, similar to what Lawrence has just described? It, it depends on their own IDP because it's quite unique and you can choose the wrong mentors to help them. So we, we have a lot, of, a lot of small groups with uh, different coaches. So um, some kids, they have two or three different coaches during the week, but some kids have seven or eight different coaches. So it depends on, uh, on their own IDPs. And it also depends if I'm there in a week or a specialist is joining me to go to a center. But I think the average is, is three or four different coaches every uh, every practice. And on Saturday, um, yeah, we have four or five coaches each age group, and you have four or five assistant coaches, and they all go going to switch to uh, coach different teams. But sometimes, uh, if you look to one month, you're an under eleven player. Two times they play with under eleven. Two times they play with under twelve. So that's the reason why you have most of the time every Saturday you have a different coach. So every, every Saturday, at least once a week, there'll be a change of coach. I say that uh, every week, so at least once a week, they'll, they'll be seeing a different coach. Yeah, on Saturday, yeah. On Saturday, you see every Saturday another coach. So I think your, your, own, your own coach, your own mentor, you see in a year, you, you we coach you uh, four or five, six times in a year. So that's a really big change. So when you were sort of talking, uh, and both of you want, you know, you want players who take ownership of their own development. And I don't know whether I'm, I, I probably the, the image that I have is now probably taking it to extremes. When you mentioned that it, depending on those players' individual, individual plans, it's almost the players, I presume, within within sort of conjunction with the coaches developing those individual plans, but it almost comes to a point where they are then choosing which coaches they will go to because they will see this is where my focus needs to be. Um, yep, yep. Again, both just, just, um, it goes, it goes on two ways. It's just, you have your own mentor. And he chooses different coaches, or I, I choose different coaches, but we, we spend half the time in our sessions. They can choose what they want to improve, just focus points or sending abilities. And those groups change uh, also every day. But sometimes they don't need a coach. They don't need a mentor because they do shooting practices by their own. By, by, by their own. Sometimes the specialist is a under 12 player who helps under 10 kids to shoot better then so he's he's sort of mentoring. Uh, sometimes we show them little clips of uh, of, of benchmark with uh, with Messi or Ronaldo or with Henderson or so they 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 pick their own uh, clips and they perform things in the training session and the the mentor is the clip with a with a sort of a, a good player in, in the first team and they can choose the different mentors. Um, so it's, it's 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 on both ways. Just what we think is the best, but also. The half the time is what the player thinks is, is the best. He can choose his own mentoring because I, 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 I'm on rid of one coach for 16 players. And if we have a really bad relationship, I have a really bad coach and that's really bad for my own development. And it, it, if I had last year a really good coach with a good relationship, why can't I choose that coach? Because I have a new coach. So I want a lot of kids to have two or three different mentors and if you have a good relationship with your previous coach, he's also your mentor. So that's the reason why children can choose a lot of different mentors. You say about the IDPs, it's quite interesting, our experiences of IDPs. Um, we, in, in essence, we, every, every game the children play with us, we have a, an electronic system that is provided by the Premier League and the children reflect on their performance. And then the coach will go in and write a description of what they thought they did well, what they think we could do better in the future, what we could concentrate in the coming weeks. That seems to work quite well. When we tried the classic IDP, you know, I need to be able to bend the ball better with the inside of my right foot or something. We found that was quite um, an onerous system. I don't know if it's a cultural thing, but for us, we, particularly at nine and 10, we didn't find it as productive as we would hope. So we would end up setting all these goals them to do. And all of a sudden we were all chasing our tails on the goals and, and the kids were really saying, I, I like playing football type thing. 
Now, I don't know whether that's a UK cultural thing, but we found that hard. And I'm interested, you saying, you know, the kids will automatically do this for us, particularly. So we tend to, just to give a, an insight to our approach, so we have this uh, individual reflection system that operates every single week, every single game. You write on there, this is what happened, this is what I did well. And there are some players who can articulate that very well, and some who can't. And the coaches will give them feedback and say, here's something to work on. Um, but when we were sort of trying to do this very, very structured discipline approach, it just didn't work for us. We, we couldn't, it wasn't productive. So the way we work, it, it tends to be foundation phase. We restrict it to what we call the PMA, match day reflections. So it's driven through that. Once they get to the youth development phase, it starts becoming more specific. So they will get video clips of their game and they have to clip what they had in it. And so the feedback system goes to video clips but also the, the training sessions become more individualized. So you have the characteristics to be a good right back or whatever it may be. So these are, so it's now about mm -hmm. where you're going to fit in in a, a team, if you like. So what about your experience with that issue? Because we, we find it difficult. And like I say, it might be cultural, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it is different, but um, every player can choose if they, if they want to use their IDPs. So okay. we, have also, we also have players that don't use it. They only use their own clips. Uh, a coach give me a clip of my uh, three best 1v1 attacking uh, uh, action make so a, com a compilation. Um, so it's, it's, they don't have to fit in their IDPs after every training sessions or after a match. But some, if, if you want to do it, it helps you to be a better full player. You, you can use it. Some, some, some kids have their, their IDP on their phones. Some have IDP on the paper. So they can, if, if you want to use it, there is a way you can use it. So that's the reason why you have the IDPs, but it's not uh, required for every player. They can choose whatever they want. But okay. what, what we say, if you if you put you, that's, that's the reason why we call it a focus point. If you think three times in a match that you have to um, use your, your, your weak feet, if you, if you focus on two, two times a match, it's really good because it's two times more than you normally do. So if you put your focus on it six times, seven times, it's really good. But normally, the, what I think is the the uh, a bad situation is if you put results on your focus points. So if you put goals. So for example, I need to uh, shoot three times in a match with my left feet. Uh, and if you if you did it twice, it's really bad because you promised me you do it three times a match, not two times a match. If you if you have done it three times after half an hour, you think ah oh, I can check the box and I'm going to shoot in my right. So that's the reason why we call the focus points instead of goals. So it's not required, and they can choose if they want to use it, uh, because we also find it out. I, I, I did four years ago. It was uh, it was required. So in, in in three months, we had a talk with the parents and with the player, and we 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 said to the player, "Why your book? Why did you fill in forms that we ask you to do in the book? So you don't want to develop because you don't fill in your book." And I think that's a really bad situation because if you want it, it can help you. If you don't want it, Please uh, leave it on your uh, on your um, on your office. Now we seem to be merging now quite nicely then into with the players' individual plans. What it is your your focus is with that development within that within those age groups. Um, so I just wonder then what would a typical like what do those training blocks look like? Um, I know in the presentations you kind of kind of touched on them slightly and you have again again there but um yeah the training sessions in the regional development centers are they always going to be sounds like not every if i went on a tuesday night to each a video looked at a video of each regional center i'm not imagine i'm seeing in exactly the same session going on no i'm, I'm really glad you don't um <laughs> because we have um yeah, we, have, we have a system and coach you can choose on what, what day do you want to, um, to put a program in? So we say you train 10, 10 hours a week. And in 10 hours, um, you, um, unopposed skills, you have to train it to two hours. And what we do, we, we call it a box system. So we use different, different boxes in a, in, on, on the pitch. So we have a box three, box 10, and box nine. So it's a defensive uh, midfield and, and, and the final third of the box nine. And we have two sides um at the pitch so and we combine boxes that we know that all the skills you need in every box 
they 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 train uh, in a year, and the, the coaches can choose um, uh, to choose their own program during a week and what they think is is best for the individual, just for the groups. But we we all know all the skills that they need in defensive wise, but also in attacking wise, they do during that week. But they can choose when they want to do things. There's also because we have a lot of specialists, they travel around the development centers. So yeah, if, if you're on Monday at once, you, you can't be at the same development center uh, and then you are over there. So that's the reason why we, we change everything during the week. Um, so they have to they have to they have to do everything what we send them in different elements in the training sessions. Um, but they are they are free to do whatever they want to do. But we have a sort of we we train two and a half hour, first half an hour. Everybody can train on our IDPs or they can train with subgroups. Then in two hours training sessions, it's based from skill to principle and from principle to tactics. So we do unopposed things in skills. Then we do it in um, overload underloads uh, or positional games. And then we play in a really small side area. And then the, the last half an hour, we play uh, a match. And this we, we call it operational spaces or we call it uh, you can use offside lines. Um, so instead of the awareness, what Lawrence t- uh, talked about, um, the first half now you, s- you play with a really small side, a small side, so you play in your box. And then the last half now we, we put offside lines with operational boxes. So you have box three, 10, nine, we play in 10, we play with offside lines. So they can, you, you have to be really skillful in the small side area, but also you can. Uh, be aware of the space in your back. So that's the reason why we want a striker making a run behind the last line. We want defenders who can space a lot of uh, 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 space in their backs. And we have, want to have a goalkeeper who can make a run uh, to come out on the goal, to stay in his own goal. But if you don't put the space, they can't develop uh, those things. That's the reason uh, why we have this, that kind of system. So, yeah, to be go back on your question... Uh, if you do all those elements, you bring your training week um, and you combine it with the IDP, so with the focus points, in our, in our opinion, you have a really good training week, but it's, it's not the same at each age group, it's not the same and on each development centers, but the mentors are taking care of that all the kids and all the players have the every skill that they need, they get during the week or during the month. We, we, we're slightly different, I think, to that in, in its context of our typical week, by the way, just to give you an insight to when we're in season. Uh, so Monday would be futsal. The children would do f- futsal for an hour and a half. That would be our under nines through to twelves. Um, ch- well, let's just say one day a week, the children come in for day release. So they do their education with us. That's from nine to twelve and they do football. So the football is structured into... They have, uh, they have a two-hour morning session, which is predominantly an hour of technical type work, which would probably predominantly be technical based games. Then they'll go into some more small sided games with a bit of grand emphasis. Then in the afternoon, they'll have an hour on the game, not, not patterns, but on the game about understanding, do you, are, you seeing, are, you, are you finding space? Are you getting between players, et cetera, that sort of stuff. And then they finish the day with a tournament. A Thursday, uh, the 11s and 12s would do a two hour session which the basic structure would be an hour technical, an hour on the game, building into the game. Saturday is either a game or uh, a two-hour training session. There's, but this, the, the coaches can put whatever they want into it. They just have a framework that will happen. So, for example, in the game, we might say the area of emphasis for this is trying to enable greater awareness so they're beginning to become more deliberate and controlled in their play. Mm-hmm. So that would be the type of thing. And the coach would do whatever drills they want. And Sunday would be a game. So for us, it's about, we would like you to concentrate on areas of emphasis. Not We're not going to tell you this is what you must do. You can put whatever you want in it. So um, yeah, it's really interesting. I'm really intrigued by the stuff you're saying also about the coaches, the adaptation and race. We did last year, we did, we was, we'd stay with the team for two weeks. So it was always a rolling coach thing. And it was the coaches who didn't like it. They said it's not enough time to work with the children. Although they got to know them, they were the ones that came back and said, so we change it this week to an eight-week cycle to see if that was better. But it's really interesting how your preference is the opposite to what our coaches thought. Mm -hmm. But that's the sort of way we approach it. So for us, we give a structure and we give a clear emphasis. 
but the content is completely at the discretion of the coach. And do, do the do the boys like that? Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's I, I think that the big thing with with us is it's we do very little uh, unopposed and very little chalk and talk. It's very much constraint driven. So we'll do things like rondos. We'll do things like uh, technical. We we'll do technical skills. We even do a section like, for example, on our day release, we have an hour of a mix of Pilates and movement for football, as we call it. Mm. So they get so it's because we can't do much of the sort of uh, anaerobic stuff at that stage. So that's the type of stuff we do. But uh, for example, attendance on day release is ninety five percent plus in all age groups from nine to twelve. So If I was to say to the children like it, yes, they do. Mm -hmm. that they, and you know, children love it's football's a game at the end of the day, isn't it? So if I want them engaged, playing games is a very good way of learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's that's I guess where we come from. Um, so I couldn't tell you categorically they love it or enjoy it, but that's what we strive to achieve, and their attendance suggests yes. And uh, do you use uh, multi skills uh, in your sessions? Um, in could you give an example of what what is what type of thing? Um, we have uh, 90 minutes in a week that we do everything in uh, sports, but not football. Okay. And then... Right. That's the, uh, no, we don't use it in our curriculum. We have this section that is um, working on agility, working on range of movement, etc. You know that sort of thing. But we tend to leave that to school. Because when okay. they're in school, they'll play cricket, they'll play football, they'll play rugby. They, so we tend to leave that to school. And if they say they said, I'm playing for the school rugby team, I can't come to training on Monday, we'd say, fine. That's quite all right. We, and if they want to play for their school's team when we're training, we say, that's fine as well. We, we, we don't mind that. So we, we give them the flexibility to choose those types of things, but we don't include it as part of the curriculum. But how, how's the level of the teachers on school in... in, in... For example, with uh, with rugby or with water skills on school, how's yeah, the level yeah, of teachers? I, yeah, I, I guess I, I couldn't comment because hours are dispersed across the area, and I wouldn't have gone in. And it will be varied. There'll be some that are very good, and there are some that not. Um, so it's a thing we don't control, mm. but um, it's an approach, right or wrong. We, we've sort of said we're going to leave the multi sports to other areas. So during lockdown, for example, where, where all sports. We would do um, two, three times a week. We would do hit sessions with them on there, and we have that. We every day there will be set something that might include um, some strange skill or something like doing a two thousand meter time trial or something. Just and they look, they would do it. They would come back. It, it was interesting, but we don't make. I'm, I'm skewed around the direct answer, which is we leave that to school. We when we have them because we think we have them limited time. When they're with us, it's time for football, rightly or wrongly. Yes. Yeah. And Jim, yeah. Right, yeah, I mean, on that, I mean, what what sports are you are you doing in those sessions? And I just wanted to, the the selections of the sport are they being picked because they're viewed as being transferable skills, or do you just picking sports because there's sports that you know the boys will enjoy playing? It's just to, just for for fun. It's not necessarily with with the movement in mind. Um. So we, we combine it with our principles and with our skills. So, for example, if we have uh, we have box nine high pressure, um, there's a lot of accelerations in 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 the in the in the in the skills before we go we go in the football sessions. So, for example, if we um, we defend the box three, and then we we go into an, an handball session before we go to football. So, so defend the your own box with the circle with the same we do with handball, for example. Um, Um, so if we um, we play basketball sometimes, yeah, and we are just in the third man principle, if they score with a third man and just basketball, then they get three points instead of one point. So we taking care of the same with the skills of just football skills. They get all the skills they need in different uh, elements in sports just for the multi skills. So during the year they, they get every skill they need, uh, but we combine it with the principles um, of football to make a sort of connection or with the skills they need to perform in football situations in the second two hours of the, in, in the second hour of the training session. You, you reminded me actually when you say it, it just shows we don't place much emphasis on it. Like for example, in our movement for football, they'll play touch rugby. 
Um, they used to do wrestling, but that was frowned upon, you know, so just doing some mm. wrestling type stuff. Um, but that got frowned upon, so we had to curtail that one. But uh, so there, the type, we do them, but perhaps not as disciplined and as structured as you're right. suggesting. And then sort of we'll come a sort of move slightly away then from the, the, the training side, I think, and move move on then to the to the games programs, which uh, so you focused on quite a bit, Lawrence, in, in your in your presentation. Um, mm-hmm. I guess the first the starting point is that you already have as being part of a of the Premier League Academy setup that right, you're already allocated a certain amount of games a season, but I guess the big proviso you had there that this is not competitive in terms of you know, there's a printed league, the results are printed. Obviously, everyone wants to win when, you, when you're when you in the game itself, but there's there's no, like you, I think the, the phrase you've used when we were speaking earlier is consequence of, of that game. Yeah, we, as I said when we've talked before, we're, we're allocated 19 fixtures a year. So the game we play today is we've organised ourselves. The game we will play next week against Plymouth organised ourselves. The one against Arsenal organised ourselves. So we're issued these, not, and it leaves us with 23 weekends. Um, and some of those are filled with the Premier League. We'll put on a tournament, say uh, a Premier, a, fi- a five-a-side tournament somewhere, and we'll do that. Um, but the big thing for us, I-, I always believed that if you want to get some better at something, do it a lot. You know, volume was a, a, co- a fundamental element. And the bit that sort of has always curtailed that is I always feel that Foundation phase children are treated like they're adults in terms of the recovery rates. I was reading a, an article recently about how quickly they disperse lactic acid and acidosis from the system. And they're able to do that because they don't generate much because they can't operate anaerobically. So the recovery bit was always something that was put in place because people related to that with fully grown adults. And it, it wasn't true to the kids. So, so I knew that volume had to go up from where we were because the kids were averaging, say, 15 to 20 games a season when you when we accumulated their minutes. And it struck me as that wasn't enough experiences of the game. So we decided either by organising tournaments ourselves. Uh, we now have run a tournament with Arsenal, Chelsea and a whole host of others that works really well that embraces 30 fixtures a season. Plus, we do some other things. We look for international tournaments. So we're now in a position where our children may put in um, five and a half thousand minutes a year, which is about 70 odd fixtures if you go 80 minutes. And, um, but what we're getting is the grasp of the, the, the transfer of learning becomes more immediate, doesn't it? When you put it in the game, when we do drills on the side, the issue is always the same, will that transfer into the game? Well, it always struck me, surely the direct route is, what happens in the game, do it in the game. Now, um, we, we've, and, and to show, illustrate that, was, there's a lad I used to coach, absolutely brilliant when we did unopposed drills. And what I realized after time, he was basically playing golf. It was all premeditated. He knew what was going to happen. So when you put him in the heat of battle, he couldn't deal with it because he couldn't make decisions, see things, because it wasn't premeditated. So we'd acquired a set of skills that were not relevant to football. And of course, the great question is, why don't freestylers make great football players? It's because they only have to do one thing, which is look at the ball. So it was, it, so that was sort of thing. But the, the role of the game, quantity was a major thing. Quality was also, um, and it meant we, we were on the road a lot because we're a championship team. If we want to play Manchester United, they'll say, well, we're not traveling here, you've got to come to us. Well, we thought, well, that's the price we have to pay if we want to experience what is perceived to be better player, quality players. Um, the, the, com- the competitive element, one strand. It, it, sometimes people think we're a win-win-win. We're not, because we have a strated system. But what we are is, we know there are some games where there should be a consequence, where you, should, you haven't got three points or you get knocked out of the league because of the profound learning you gain from that as well. And so they... They would, and the variety thing that falls naturally out of it. So, for example, our under 10s will play five aside, six aside, seven aside. Uh, they might do eight, they won't, unusual for them to do nine aside. So, they'll get that variety. Our, our 11s will do, they'll, they'll do five aside tournaments, seven aside, eight aside, nine aside. They'll do the odd 11 aside even just to experience it, you know, maybe one or two a year. So, 
we knew variety, but, but the competitive bit was just part of that variety. It's all part of that rounded picture. The more experiences I get in the game, the easier it is to learn. And what matters then, the role of the coach, of course, is giving relevant and meaningful feedback. So that's where the coach becomes critical. It's not just, you know, we won, we lost, we won, we lost. It's not that. It's how we're helping this player to develop based on his experiences. I'd, I'd also be interested in what Jupe has in terms of when we start saying what position should they play and should they play in all positions. Now, what we're seeing is some players, you could play multiple positions, usually the most talented. Um, and there are some where you think it's almost characterized that there's probably not a full range of positions they could play in. Now that might be down to our recruitment, because I, I was in, that's what's interesting, you'll think about speed, because speed does give you flexibility in terms of the positions you can play ultimately in football. So for us, it was, I guess, the, the answer that the sort of complexity of our games program, we do a lot of work ourselves and we, we pursue volume. We, we probably pursue it as much as anybody in the UK, um, but it's with a clear purpose for giving that variety of experience. I think, yeah, before we uh, dig a little bit deeper into, into the variety and, and how that fits into them, I just with, with Jupe and, and, and just on that topic of volume, Jupe, is that something you, you are looking to get as many games as possible into your players or are you sort of the other side where you limit the actual number of games they play and, and your focus is more on, on being on the training ground? Um, combination. I think we have we do s similar things because we also we use adaptability in our in our program of playing matches. So we also choose different formats, and we use a lot of offside lines in our in our programs. And we're quite lucky that we can play tournaments with our uh, players because we we arrange a tournament in Eindhoven, and all the development centers are, are travel to Eindhoven, and we can play a tournament with. Uh, with more than 40 players. So then we can switch in formats and we can play our friendly games. Um, but we want we have a match on for every player every Saturday. And what we do, we play four times 50 minutes or four times 20 minutes. And we have a training session before the game um, with the same principles as the rest of the week. And sometimes when we're not quite happy with, um, with the amount of playing time because we don't have the right um, resilience, what we need. Then we play uh, a, f a five, five uh, and then we play with two teams to each other in the, in, in the fifth half of our uh, program. So then we play 50 minutes more with just our own players, or two times 50 minutes with our own players. And uh, we can, can do that in home games. Away games, is, it isn't quite easy because then the, uh, the kitman has to stay a little bit longer. <laughs> um, but so that's the reason why. Um, the players are quite angry on Saturday because we train two and a half hour in a in a training session and we play four times fifty minutes an hour on Saturday, so they're really a bit bored because they're used of two and a half hour in the sessions. And the problem that we have is it's a little bit arrogant, but we eighty percent of the teams will play competition game on on Saturday, um, we win quite easily. Um, so if if we play with our uh, with our age groups. Uh, we make a tournament with only PC teams. We have more uh, resistance than we play against other teams in Holland. So that's the reason why we love all the the, uh, the uh, tournaments abroad. Mm -hmm. Now we have the level of competition from big clubs in Europe. And that's quite good. And that's the competition that our players need. Because we can't play it against Ajax and AZ and find out every week. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's interesting that thing about the games being too easy. Um, I was talking to a colleague at, at Arsenal and he was saying they're looking into at the moment saying if we're winning too high a percentage we need to look at our games programme it's not right because you do need that degree of challenge don't you it, it's interesting uh, even in the individuals we, I can think of an individual in uh, one of our squads and uh, when we're under the pump we're losing a game irrespective you know if it's uh, an important game it's not an important game or anything um, his thoughts are completely jumbled he just thinks he has to do everything. He, he, he can't detach himself from the score. And yes, we love the competitive instinct, but its effect on him and the players around him is very, very significant. And without stressing him, we can't actually help him with it, if you see what I mean. So at the moment we're looking at, he's not the only one, there's a number of them, 
we're looking at strategies to say, how can we stress him in training in a way, but preparing for him? So maybe he can unclutter these emotions when he's under the pump. And so that's why I think just playing easy games all the time, it, it gives you a false perspective, doesn't it? And, uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. I thought I'd agree with you. Um, yeah, I'd like to there in your presentation, Lawrence, that there was yeah, some clarity, that, that understanding of the different levels of games that you would be playing in um, and going in with a very clear kind of, right, this is this is what we can take out of this game for our players. Um, things that you're, you're, like you've just mentioned there, that uh, certain players will sort of react differently in when you're under the pump and, and likewise, they, you know, you'll have a different development focus. There'll always be a development focus on on games where you're probably going to go out and win eight nil, but still try and take something worthwhile out of it. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting. Like today, uh, I was with the Elevens today, and we we're at Leicester, and it was their first um, sortie into nine aside. Uh, and as a collective group, they're a strong group, and they have some. We believe some very strong individuals. And um, they played nine aside today and they really struggled with it. It's sort of the beginning and, and their issue is not their capabilities, it's their understanding of what's happening around them. And we played on a very small pitch today. And so time was highly restricted. So, them, so for them, what we would look at with that group is when we're playing at home, we would play on bigger pitches for that, just to give them a little bit more time to start the learning process and then it gets smaller when they're able to do things quicker and embrace things quicker. So today for us, the great learning out of today is the one, their capacity to move the ball quicker, which is governed by their awareness as well. What's around them, touch, think they're doing instead of thinking before they touch. So we have a group that we have a clear stepping stone for. And some as you know, we're on the scale, some are out here, some are out here. Um, so, so for us, today's games program, it's although it's not, not a meaningless game, you know, it's just a game for us to experience stuff. We got a very good learning point out for some individuals. It's very, very specific. For some, it's subtler. So that, that's how the games program helps us. And we'll reflect on it in the daily reflections today. I think, yeah, I think you then touched on the point there that home games then, you tend to or you utilize bigger size pitches. I wonder if you uh, yeah, I, I, more detail of that. Is that pretty much, you keep the larger pitch throughout the season or is it very much when you're just getting players to adapt, encourage that, like you well, say, that greater awareness, give them a little bit more time. So you're learning behaviors, you're actually having the time to look up and look around and and then increasing speed. Is it, do you generally start to then also uh, bring the size of the pitch down or? Yeah, just I'll, I'll explain. I'll explain our approach. To that the, the uh, when we play clubs in the UK, they talk about the pitch sizes. We become a bit people a bit fixed. You're a good kind of big football pitches. The the purpose of doing it um, in the, the the accidental benefit we gained was when we go and play everybody else. They play on small pitches. So one week you play on a big pitch, next week you play on a very small pitch. So so for us, we get the best of both worlds. Uh, but the reason behind it was, as I tried to explain, uh, perhaps not as well as I should, if you're learning to juggle six balls, you start with one and build up. If you want to see pictures on a pitch to start with, I need a little bit of time to see it. And as time, you go to that Maslow framework that ends up in sort of unconscious competence where you can do things without thinking, it, that will happen. The interesting bit about the pitch is, they basically grow into it as they grow older. The pitches, in, in essence, become smaller because they can cover ground quicker and, they, and they're bigger. So it, it's become, it's interesting, it's a thing that we tend to be labelled with, and it's even a thing that we talk about, but it's become less of an issue. But, for example, for our under-11s at the moment, I would see it as an important part in their development to help them gain, a, just to give them a little bit more time on the ball. But... Uh, but the, also the misconception about the way we do things is that we only do that. We don't. So tomorrow they'll train and they'll be doing rondos and they'll be doing very small pitch games and they might do some bigger pitch. But we see that in terms of the greater understanding is one of the things that we need to 
refine and, and develop a bit more. So the pitch size would take significance for them there. But as they as they develop, it just that becomes a second reality. And for, for yourselves at, at PSV Troop, you know, when we're looking at the pitch sizes, you sort of very much on that camp that right, we just want to get as many touches in. Whereas I suppose if I'm correct me if I have this wrong though, Lawrence, but there is it kind of encourages that behavior of having that actually just getting your head up and looking and like you say, not just head down, pass, 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 pass. That so that when like you say, as the game speeds up, you're already you kind of you're bringing that behavior with you. Yeah, for us, it's a learned skill. It's a skill you learn, and and you start with everything. You you go as fast as you can, as quick as as fast as you're able, but not quicker than you're able. If you see what I mean, if that makes sense. You have to go at your speed. And that's that's how we treat that that side of it. So I mean, yeah, how does that how does that work for you, Duke, with the pitch sizes? Yeah, um, well, we, we, we analyzed uh, all formats and the similarities in all our analyzes that every, every, every kid to play, all the kids play in the box. So it doesn't matter which format you play, they all play in a box. And so that's the reason why we want the players are capable in the box, that is, which skills you need in a really small side box. But again, we put the operational space to, to add um, the awareness um, but more based on uh, things that we want to improve. So if we, we finish, we go in a finishing week, we put the offside line behind the last line of box 10. So then you get in, in situations that the, the, the midfielder can make a run behind the last line. Um, the defender needs to defend with 30 meters in his back and the goalkeeper make a decision, stay in my goal, defend my, my own space in front of me. So we put awareness in principles and the elements in the box theory, which we analyze in the game. So I think you said we have the, 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 the best of two worlds. That's the reason why we make a combination in each uh, practice of each session between the box and the operational space with, uh, with offside lines, um, sometimes diagonal offside lines, sometimes um, with sides, in the, off the offside lines or put extra boxes at the side. So that's the reason why we make combinations with boxes to help the awareness, but the awareness must be based on uh, the game of football and principles and tactics and skills. And when you're playing games, you, you're sort of having players sort of giving them their positions. You're also then keeping those players within that position throughout throughout the season or you're always looking to move players around be more adaptable get them used to be playing in different areas of the pitch it depends on uh, their outstanding abilities depends on their focus points because um what you see most of the time when you group players if you're really fast your technique is, is really poor because you're faster than your opponent so you run behind them and you can score a goal so if you're really fast you're a really good um sometimes in shooting, but really bad in passing and dribbling. Um, if you're not, not so fast, you play always in the middle, then you create awareness and you can play the one a good, touch, one a good uh, first touch and you can play a one-two because you're capable of being really aware of your situation because you're not really fast. So your ascending ability depends on uh, your, your qualities and things that you can improve. So what we do in training sessions, if you're really fast, we always put you in the middle. So then you have to be, uh, you're always not comfortable because you're in a really small, small area and you need a bigger pitch because then you can use your, your speed. And uh, what we do, we, we decide as we play always in the middle, we play him as full back with a lot of space in front of him, but also a lot of space behind him in the in, in defensive way. So that's the reason why we challenge the players during uh, uh, a training week. Um, but we don't put a striker as a central defender on the match from the Saturday. That doesn't make sense, in my opinion. But you can have a, a, a white winger that can play as a right fullback or a number 10 can play as a striker or as a central defender because then he comes in other spaces to, um, to adapt, but also to be a, improve his focus points or his ascending abilities. So, of course, we make combinations and sometimes we help them to 
don't be really comfortable in awkward situations, but we don't put everything on each position of the game to help them adapt at each position. We combine it with outstanding ability and focus points to things that, that they want to improve. Um, and the formats change, but not the position uh, uh, change. So you, you, you have to adapt in a situation, but it's always focused on your IDP and focused on your outstanding abilities because yeah, I spoke about it when you're younger. Um, you are really fast. Your technique is really poor. And, and, out, and then at the other side, it's the same. Jude, how early do you think you can characterize? It's interesting to say about the really fast players. Um, how early would you be saying, you know, like here's someone who's perhaps not the fastest, has high awareness, high technical skills. I, I can see how you use it in the training, you know, use them to expose them to some yeah. of those things. How early do you think you could say, yeah, this person is going to be a central midfield player, this person is going to be that? Because um, we, we've looked at it and we feel as though Athleticism seems to give you greater versatility. Um, if you're short on speed, for example, it doesn't mean that you can't excel, but it's probably more restricted as to where you can play on the pitch. So do you look at those things? I, I was interested in what you were saying then about uh, the star qualities, as you're calling it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think around 11, 12 years old, um, but now you, can, you can't say you're a number 10 or you're a number six, you're a right winger, but you can say he's a decider. He is uh, one who plays at the wings. Because if you're a really good yeah. dribbler and you have intuition, you always play in a wing. If you're really good in decision-making awareness, you always play in the middle. Um, so we don't put them in a box. That's your position. We're going to de develop you only on that position, but you can make combinations of different positions. So that's the reason why I think you're a central midfielder, you're a six or a 10. But in modern football, you need all the skills in box 10 because you need to defend, you need to attack, you need to have a good transition. Um, so I think we, we check the boxes if you are a good striker, but if you want to come between the lines, you're number 10. And if you're number 10, you want, want to make a run behind the last line, then you're number nine. So that's sort of combination we make. Okay. Um, so in that boxes we pick, and I think you can, you can see because we test everything, it's around 11, 12 years old. We can make a, a clear decision. And if you look to outstanding abilities, I don't select a team. I select different outstanding abilities and different kind of different players. And it makes a team. And the similarities are just in the behavior and the dedication. And the, the similarities are just in the adaptability. I think those are key elements to, to, our, to, to have a good team while you're on a 13 coach. But in my opinion, if you're in the development center, you can do the same. So if you have on a 13, 15, 14, 15, 16, you can do the same as what we do in the foundation phase. But there we have a lot of coaches who want to win a match. And now we think the dynamic of the team is the most important, the most important thing. But I don't agree. So I think if you put that line from the foundation phase till on a 15, and then you're going to prepare them to play as a team, um, then you have three or four years to prepare them to be a good team player in the first team, but in the first 10 years of career, they developed or assigning abilities and similarities to what you need to become a good football player. That's, that's, that's my uh, own unique philosophy, how I look to do to, uh, to individual development of, of, of football players. It's an interesting one, that one about there. Uh, we, we had a lad who was with us, he was exactly as you described, breathtaking speed uh, he was at man city for a period of time and um when he was he was eight it was just you know really really jet propelled he, he's at Schalke at the moment and um his weakness was always the same one in that his individual capabilities were extraordinary that he, as soon as he stopped the defender he could beat them what he wasn't perhaps so good at was seeing what was happening around him mm. recognizing the options around him and um, some, and perhaps he didn't work as hard on some of the things, but but he, you know, he's he's an incredible lad. But it, that one star quality, as you describe it, was really, really exceptional. Very soft feet as well, very delicate mm -hmm. feet, you know. But the speed, I, I think he he was quickest on the speeds tests when he was seventeen at Man City, but nine seventeens in the first team as well. Mm. So so he's very very quick. But um, it is and. 
I mean, I, I'm interested in the fact that you test your players on arrival. You know, you 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 prep. You're basically saying you know their speed capabilities and all. Uh, that's not something we've done. We tend to do it once they're in the system, and we use our eyes to judge it. Uh, but that, that's interesting how, how you start picking the players out and the importance of speed. So there, you brought that up as well on the the positional side of things, Lawrence. I mean, at Cardiff, where are you? starting to, one to almost put players into position similarly do you have you go right in your games program that right everyone has their position and that's where they yeah. play or do you look to mix it, it up it, in foundations? some ways it's quite similar to you we at nine and ten they don't have positions they have positions they're better at than others you know but they, they don't have positions at 11 and 12 we're starting to think about them in relation to the game um are we always as flexible in where they play as we should be? Probably not. I don't think we're as um, disciplined and detailed as Jupe has described with his guys. I don't, I don't think we're as, uh, as detailed as that. But uh, we're still, like some players, we couldn't even characterise what their best position would be. They sort of, you think, oh, they could be this, they could be that, they could be this, they, they've got qualities to do this. And sometimes they don't have a superstar quality, but they tend to be a good seven out of 10 everything, if you see what I mean. And they're, they're the ones sometimes we find harder. It's interesting, there's a lad I can think of at the moment that we're working with. He has extraordinary speed. His, his dribbling has become very good as well. So he's developed that. And he's now the point, you can see the next part of his development is seeing things because mm. if he gets it, the first decision is dribble. And, and, that, and so with him, I, I don't know how you find that. I find that as one of the hardest things to unlock with him because we're saying it's not just you win the ball. We've, we've got to see. It. And, and that, that's how we unlock that is our challenge. And that's what our program is meant to do. We design it around it. But that requires specific help for him on that. Lots of goals and lots of challenges. Yeah, and a lot of disappointment for him. Mm. Because if you put him always as a central midfielder in a really small side area, and give him, give him a limited of one or two touches, then he has to uh, be aware of a situation. Then you you he needs to look around him to make the right choice if you play one one or two touches. Mm. And I, I don't like to put a limit on touches, but for those kind of players, it's good just for one hour in the training session. Yeah, I, I, I'm the same. We, we, we tend to, uh, we'll do them, we'll do limited touches if we have a reason to. Yeah. We, we don't do it as a, a rule. Everyone has to do it. It's right at the moment, there's, it, it might be as an individual we put on it, or there's a collective need here, then maybe limited touches. Is a, but it, it's part of the session. It's not the whole session. But we're, we're the same. We're, so it's so our approach to that. Um, what, what about the, um, where do you stand on the issue of competitiveness? Because I'm, I'm intrigued. And I, I apologize if that's breaking from the script a bit, but I'm intrigued because there are some see it as the, the ultimate evil, some see it as a necessity or a priority. Where, where do you guys sit on it? Um, it the, I, I think it's, it's in our system because the, all, all our boys need challenges. So if we give them homework, they ask for a challenge. Can we do a challenge? I want to be the best in juggling, for example. Yes. Um, so what we say, um, uh, you have to make a clip and send it to the coach. And he gives you points and we put it in a, in, in a table and after two months there's someone who is the best in homework um, then we have a lot of, we do once a month a test and in the beginning um, all the coaches were quite angry angry because uh, we had um, 90 minutes training sessions and the test cost us on half an hour so there was 60 minutes spent for just to to play football and to to practice now we have two two and a half hour training sessions so all the coaches are quite happy that we test a lot, but all the players come to the performance staff after a result, after a test to ask for the results. So they're quite competitive because they ask for the results. Am I faster than the last time? I did a test on the first 10 meters or did I jump higher than, than, than a month ago? And it's the same with, if you play a positional game and you play with or without a competition, it's, it's a really big difference in performance. And then I can be, a, I'm really demanding coach in performance, but I don't have to be a demanding coach if I put a competition on it. So if, if we have three teams in a positional game, one leader in, for one group, 
And if you have a point, you have to shout your point. So then in 10 minutes, you shout six points, seven points, eight points, nine points. And some kids are crying because they lose a positional game in 10 minutes. And if I say it's not good that you cry, then I'm a really bad coach. So I let things happen and, and, and help the players to lose, how to, how to deal with a loss. It's really important because you need it. So there's competition in every part of the session because they love it, because you're quite competitive. And then you have to say on Saturday because you, 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 you spoke about earlier, what you put in, you get out. So if you put a lot of competition in it, you also get competitive games on Saturday. Um, but if you know to deal with a loss, it's quite easier for us if we play big tournaments and we lost half final with a penalty. They don't cry because they're really proud that we became half finalists um, because they, de they dealt with a loss during the season. So I take advantage of the competitors for competitive sides in, 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 in on Saturday, Sunday or with tournaments. Um, but we as coach are also quite competitive. But we don't argue with the players after losing a game. We're not angry on them, yeah, yeah. and we help them to to come come over the loss because we think you learn more from a loss than to win a tournament. Yeah, that, that, that's really interesting. I, I'm intrigued because you said about the speed testing and think and the other testing. Our guys, when they do the speed testing, we do ours about every three months or so, so it's done on that sort of frequency. What they're interested in: did they beat so and so? That what they're not interested in, did I beat my score last time? Yeah. Mm. And now that's see, that's a difference. That's a that's I, I'm thinking that already. I'm thinking, and as a club, I don't think we do trend analysis well enough. So is this the benchmark at 11? Should we know what he's doing over 20? What, what's the what's good at 20 at 20 meters for this? And what's good for me? Am I better than I did last time? Yeah. But in athletics, that's normal. That, that's just that's just the way it is. Am I quicker? Am I quicker? Am I slower? Am I, that's it. And I, I, that's interesting. That your guys will actually ask that question. Am I quicker than last time? And, and, that, and that's, that's, that's that's something I'm going to take away from tonight, and how we can instill that in our kids. Yeah, and that's that's the reason why I don't like. Uh, I, I I think team sport is um, um, is a joke for individual development. Because if you're the best player on the nine and you all train with the same team, you're not the best player anymore if you are on the 15. The guys who want to be the best player, so number three and four instead of uh, performance, they want to become the best player. And there's, there's, and after one or two years, the second best player is the best player because he has competition. It's the same with, um, with, with beating a score. If, you, if you're an average on a team, you'd be better than your teammate, yeah, then you're not better at yourself. But if you train in different groups and different elements, it doesn't matter which, which team uh, makes you make a test of play a match, it's on, and it's on your own. So you have to compete yourself every day because you are in different, uh, in different groups. So what we do, the best player on a nine, he trains at under 11 and he's the worst player. And you have to deal with it because you have to make solutions in your head because next time you train at under 11, you have to improve in some things because you want to be the best player at that age. Um, if you become the best player on 11, now we put you on 12. So we stretch a lot of players because we believe and you have to be once a week the best player and three or four or five times a week, you have to be the worst player because then you have to find solutions to become the best player. So in that, in that system, I think, if you are the best player on nine, you're still the best player at on 13 on your own uh, level of your own age. Um, so that's the reason why we split a lot of different groups that players are get competition every day to stretch not only uh, to stretch only themselves, not a team. So not a team result, your own result. And mm -hmm. if you are if you are really uh, a brutal player with your own age group, you play a Rondo, for example, and you get you, you, you laugh about a player who's always a defender in the middle. You 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 play him through his legs. You play a Pana. You got you got to yell at them. You can make jokes of him. But then a day later, when you train on a 12, you're the guy who's in the middle. And then you, you, you know how it is to be the defender for 10 minutes. So the next time you, you train your own group, you're going to help the players in the middle to get out of the middle that another goes, uh, goes to defend. So also in, in leadership, it helps you to develop the players, not only just a football player, but also to get at competitive size every day and to become a better football player, not as a team, but as an individual. Yeah, it, it does intrigue me, the competitiveness, because I know there are two schools, aren't there? 
There's those who say it doesn't develop you and those who say it does. I um, Perhaps I have a, a confirmation bias based on my experiences, but competition always did me the world of good when I when I was training. Uh, I can still tell you what my best time for 600 metres was, 800 metres for 10K. Mm. I, I know it to 0.1 of a second. It, it was it was really important to me. Um, so, but that's, it, it's interesting to hear you guys because when, when we play Dutch teams, they're always competitive. I, I've never played a Dutch team that doesn't play. You know, everybody plays to win, but you know, you sense the drive to win. Never, never experienced it. I guess the challenge, and I think the way the UK has gone into it is, the UK is blessed with awful lot of people who would like to be the next Jose Mourinho and they sometimes forget, they detach from the process of developing the children and get more caught up in that, you know, we've lost the game here today. It's more how the coaches deal with it than how the players deal with it, I think, was the issue. And it's ended up with this less than competitive programme. Well intended, but I think perhaps caused by a separate issue, which was the coaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, within that, I mean, it's always the question is, do you need a league, league table? I mean, I think you're right that it was there to sort of change the behaviour of the coaches. I think, like you say, young players, you, it doesn't matter what you do, whether it's something in training as simple as a as a running test, they're all competing against each other. Everyone yeah. is trying to be, be the fastest that level of competition will, will always be there. Um, so I don't know then, like I say, with with yourself, were you describing your own experience and competition drove you? I wonder if there's that balance that one of athletics is to a certain extent an individual sport. So you always have that mindset of I'm trying to better myself. Although yes. was there someone within your cohort who was a real driver of your development that someone that you was always looking to compete against? I, I think there's that. Uh, the, unless you're um, David Radisha and you can run 800 metres in one minute, 40 seconds, there's always, you know, there are people who are better than you. And so the interesting bit is when you compete against those people, you, you're able to adapt and recognise that I don't have the capability to beat this individual, but this individual can help me go further. Yeah, I, I don't think so. So there's an acknowledgement and acceptance of where you are in the food chain, but it's also a great thrust for saying, yeah, this could take me to a different level. This, this could do that. So the league table bit, I think it's one of those things that the way we've structured it now, some of our games have it. It's part of the variety. It's, you know, it's something that's needed in certain areas. You don't actually need it in every game because, short, because there are sometimes you have to think about the process around the outcome, don't you? And so it's nice sometimes to be in a position. But if we were doing a tournament and we were playing PSV in, say, in Izmir, then we would be thinking, how do we beat Izmir? How do we beat uh, PSV? Yeah, that, that would be the thought process. And if they beat us or we lose on penalties or something, they, they, I tell you a story, Izmir is a good one because we played the hosts who PSV actually beat in, in, in the next round. And they beat some penalties. And there was probably about... 2,000 people watching, and the lad who missed the critical penalty had to take a penalty about six months later in the Truce Cup, which our team won, and he scored the winning penalty. And so for him, experiencing that, as horrific it was, it was from the time he was a bit distressed and everything, that was really important. Learning that the thing that Jeep says about the losing, that they're the, the critical experiences. They're the ones that stay with you. And he doesn't necessarily have complete control over whether he's got that penalty, but he went up and had another go. He didn't run away from it. So for me, I'm looking at that and I was thinking, yeah, he's, he's gained from that process. He hasn't, he's not running away. He's taking responsibility. So there, that's where I think it's competitiveness and the individual, of course, an athlete, it's, it's just me. But I've always thought, what if you could get a team of individual athletes called football players and they thought like individual athletes, would that make them better? I suspect so, particularly in an academy level, but very difficult. Yeah, very much so. I think, yeah, we're about, about coming to the uh, the end of our session uh, time-wise. So I don't know whether, Jupe, whether you uh, have a, a final word on that. Well, that's, that's maybe the best questions so far. 
Um, and, and sort of an ad advice to uh, to the guests, or what do you ex expect for my final words? <laughs> Whatever has, has, has entered your mind at this at this at this at this stage of the discussion, whether you have something to add upon that. What was uh, Lawrence was just saying there regarding competition, or there was a, a point that you uh, would like to summarize from the discussion today? Yeah, no, not 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 really, to be honest. I'm 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 still thinking about everything uh, Lawrence said in the last hours, but I, I don't really have a question because it's it's quite a clear part away and a clear clear way he, he, he wants to work and love similarities how we uh, want to work and love differences but mm. I think we, we both do things because we think that's the best for our own academy and I think that's that's always the best philosophy that you um yeah you have you have your own philosophy in the club system philosophy and you combine it together and then you have the perfect outcome but it's really different for God than for PSV so I think it's both it's both good because uh we think it's the best, so it's, it's, it's always always great to talk about uh, similarities and differences in in the boat academy. So I'm I'm I think I've overthink it till, till tomorrow, and then maybe I've, I have another question or a summary, but not 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 at this moment. Perfect, uh, Lawrence. Any any final words from yourself? I, I think I'd echo that. I think the the, the thing it's almost like religion. It's saying which is the best religion. Um, whichever one you believe in is the one that matters, and you know that, that's the truth. And it, it's interesting. I, I listen to Jupe's uh, approach, and it's very detailed and very precise. And I'm looking. I'm thinking, oh, we, we could be doing that. We could be doing that. So for me, the thing is, it's it's a, avoiding that confirmation bias of your own methods and saying, oh, we need to do it. We stick with what well, this is how we do. It. This is the right way. It's being able to actually look at what someone else is doing. I think there's some stuff in here that I could use and we could use. And some of the things you said tonight, I'm thinking, yeah, you know, I, I could get some changes in our methods to, to enhance what we believe is our way, not necessarily the right way, but it's our way. And so it's, it, but being, it, being exposed to this sort of thing when I'm listening to, to Zoop, it just broadens my perspective and stops me getting into those narrow paradigms of the football's this football world is this wide. It's actually this wide when you're you know, taking others. So from my uh, takeaway for tonight is there's an awful lot, as you've said, that I can now I'll go away and reflect on. Now, whether I'll do it at all, I don't know, but there are some things in there that I definitely will reflect on. And I know when I'm talking about them over the next couple of days, I'll be saying, well, PSV, do it this way, you know, that sort of thing. And, and so that for me, it's made me think and reflect and suggest maybe this may is that we could change. So from a very positive experience for me uh, for doing something like this. So, so thank you. Thank you, I guess.